see you all. It's great to see your lovely faces. So I'd like for you all, if you can, please turn to Psalms. It is 95, Psalm 95. If you don't know where Psalms is, it's right in the middle of your Bible. Like if you were to open it up to almost the center, it would be just about right there. So go to chapter 95. So everybody give me an amen once you have it. So, Psalm 95, verse, let's see, I just lost it. Sorry, guys, be patient with me. Okay, so, verse 6 and 7, I'm going to go ahead and read it, and you guys just follow along. In my version, it says, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So keep that in mind as we just worship today, that we truly just bow down and worship and offer our hearts, offer our focus, offer everything to God. And also just remember that he is God, that he is our God. So with that, I'd like to invite you all to stand. Um, and if that is your form of worship, please join us in doing that. And if it's dancing, if it's kneeling, then you're more than welcome to do that too. You may dance in the back. <laughs> so again, just allow this song to just be pouring out of your heart. You know, just let it, let it consume you. Let it just be your prayer to God and just sing your heart out. So go for it.
amazing is it to know that we have a God <laughs> who never fails. He truly never fails. Um, just to think about that. It's amazing. And also that nothing can ever separate us. <laughs> that we are reminded of is the fact that 
a lot of times we do cry out to God and say, you know what, God, I want to be close, close to your side. And to know that heaven is real and death is alive, because we all know that once you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you, you don't die. Your spirit moves on, and you go to heaven. It's just a beautiful place to be. So let this be your prayer to be near to God. today and with this last song we just want to just be reminded that just of who God is and how great he is and how when Jesus came to this earth you know he was he was God he was the word in the flesh and um, just to let the thought of that sink in you know that for a time God himself came to this earth and spent time here and um, and you know that when Jesus died and rose and eventually ascended, that God sent the Holy Spirit to dwell with us, to live within us. So even even though Jesus is no longer here, you know God is still here with us. And just how amazing that is to think of that. You know, so often we think of God as just this far away. Oh, He's up in heaven, but no, He's here with us. You know, He's within us. And um, so just the idea of that as we sing this last song, just to keep that in mind.
Father God, I just thank you. Thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the word that you've put in Alex's heart to give today, God. And I just pray that you'd open our hearts, God, that you would open our eyes to um, and open our ears, God, to see, to hear, and to know what it is that you want to speak to us today, God, to hide your word in our hearts, Lord, so that, as it says in James, God, we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but we would be doers of the word, God. And just show us what it is to love you more, Lord. Show us what it is to to obey you, God, and um, just to live for you with full abandonment, full surrender. Lord, and so I just thank you for this sermon. I thank you for um, what you're going to do today and just how you're going to move. And um, Lord, we just lift up this service to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let me get some stuff out of the way, first of all. First of all, we're having just a few, like, minute technical difficulties, so... If anything pops up or something weird happens, don't worry about it. We're just going to go and let God do what he wants to do. Also, let me say this, is that if you don't have a bulletin, just raise your hand and someone will gladly bring you one. Because what I want you to do is there's going to be some very awesome verses today that are going to be very relevant to write down in answering the question, is Jesus God? Is Jesus God? And that's an extremely relevant question. So we got some hands over here. Uh, You guys should have a pen on your chair. If you need Bibles also, guys, we got free Bibles for you too. So nobody in this church should ever walk out without having the Word of God in their hands. So let me say this also. Many of you, well, a number of you said, you know, what's it like to go to seminary? What's it like to be in Bible college? Today we're going to get a small taste of that. I'm not going to overwhelm you guys, but I am going to feed you very, very, very well thick meat today. All right? But I promise I will not leave you behind. Okay. So, if you will, take God's one and only written word and turn it to Luke chapter 5, verse 20. Luke chapter 5, verse 20. Now, I must confess something. Last week, I told you guys that this week we're going to be talking about illness and sin. And if we sin, does that cause illness in our life? When we get sick, when we get hurt, when we get ill, when cancer sets in, when bodily issues happen, is that a result of sin in my life? And that's what we were going to talk about today. So instead of talking about that, we're going to move that to next week, and here's why. Because as I was going through the scriptures today, or not today, but this past week, the Lord really showed me an issue in here that is too big, too significant, too relevant to modern day Christianity that we can't overlook it. And here's the issue. Is Jesus God? Now you could say, well, yeah, of course he is. But the people who disagree, they could say, well, no, he's not. And if we leave it at that, there's no difference between the two. They say no, you say yes. We've done nothing to elevate Jesus as God, if indeed he is God. And so let's go ahead and do this. If you haven't already, turn to Luke chapter 5, verse 20, and let me pray for what's about to take place. Heavenly Father, God, we lift this up to you. We thank you so much for what you're going to do. We thank you so much for what you've done. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for what you've done this past week in the hearts of all the hearers in this room, Heavenly Father. So God, right now, Heavenly Father, move in our hearts. Convict us, stretch us, refine us, mold us, encourage us. Lord, may you do what you want to do. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up, going through elementary, going through middle school, going especially through high school, I would always ask that question to myself, why in the world do I need to learn this? What do I need to know all the periodic table of elements for? Who cares? Pythagorean theorem? Really, am I ever going to use this? And so we'd ask those questions to each other or to, you know, a classmate or, you know, under your breath. And so throughout life, you kind of ask that question, what in the world am I ever going to use this for? But unfortunately, 
that same question, that same attitude, which I once had, people often apply that to the Bible. And they look at things in the Bible and they say, is this relevant? Why should I care? How is this ever going to apply to my life? And so the question we have now is this question before us today. Is Jesus God? Now, if you will, take a look at the text with me. Luke chapter 5, verse 20. And we're only going to go through two verses, but these are extremely significant, extremely relevant to your walk with the Lord, especially in 2014. So, Luke chapter 5, verse 20, and it says this. In fact, before I say it, let me just back up a quick bit. Remember what we talked about last week. Remember where we talked about how the paralytic was brought in by four of his friends. Okay, let me paint the picture. Is that this, this, these four men wanted to bring their paralyzed friend on a mat to Jesus Christ. They show up to the house where Jesus is, but they could not get in. The house was packed. It was packed around the house. They could not get in, but they didn't let any excuse get in the way of bringing their friend to Jesus. And so what they did is they went on top of the roof, they dug a hole in the roof, and they lowered their friend right in front of Jesus so that Jesus couldn't miss it. And that's where we are now. That's where we are now. So in verse 20, it says this. When Jesus saw their faith of the four men, When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, if we just read that, we're going to look past it. Guys, that is so significant. We look at it now, we're just like, Jesus forgives sins. Yeah, we know that. Well, yeah, we know it because we have the complete Bible. We're 2,000 years later. Hindsight is great, and we have hindsight into the entire Bible. But back then, for Jesus, for anybody to say that, was huge. Verse 20 explains why, or verse 21. Verse 21 says this, that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Blasphemy. Well, if you don't know that word, blasphemy really means to take the sacred name of God and to misuse it, to speak ill of it. That's blasphemy. And in their minds, Jesus just did that. Why? Because of this next part of the verse that says this. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they're absolutely right. Nobody can forgive sins but God alone. We know this. 1 John 1, 9 says what? That if we go before God and we confess our sins to God, he will be faithful and forgive us. So only God can forgive sins. So if what Jesus just said in the whole assembly of people, he just told, I don't know, a hundred, a thousand people, whoever could hear, he just said, I am God because I forgive sins. So for Jesus to stand before a crowd and pretty much say, I am God, man, get the stones. That was the right away the idea that they had in their mind because Jesus just committed blasphemy and we had more than two witnesses who can say the same thing now before we go on though I need you to understand we really can't blame the Pharisees and we can't blame the people there for thinking that this is blasphemy we can't blame them for wanting to stone Jesus because at this point in their mind only God can forgive sins They don't quite understand yet that Jesus is claiming to be God. They don't quite get the whole story yet. And if we were in their shoes and Jesus just said that and we heard him, we would probably be like, Jesus, I like what you've done. Thanks for healing my grandma, but get the stones. You're good, but you ain't that good, Jesus. That's the mindset of what's going on right now. Hit the next slide. So here's a question before us. This is why it's so relevant. Is Jesus God? That's the question. That is the question. Now, I'm sure many of us again would say, yes, Jesus is God, of course. 
But how can we prove it? What do you have to differentiate Christianity from every other religious belief system? Hit the next slide. Here's why it's so relevant to today. Because you have people coming to your door. You have people coming into your living room. You have people speaking into the life of your kids, trying to talk to your spouse, trying to talk to you to believe what they believe. And here's what they believe. The Jehovah's Witness, the Mormons, the Scientologists, they all say this. They say, yes, there is a Jesus, but I tell you this, he is not God. He may be a good man. He may be the son of God, but he is not God. Now we're at conflict. Christianity and these three. Hit the next slide. These three too. You have the Christian scientists who say the same thing. They say, hey, listen, Jesus, good guy. Son of God, maybe. God? Absolutely not. Islam. Guys, Islam, they say, hey, you know what? We're, we're just like the Christians. We serve the same God. No, we do not serve the same God. The God of Islam says that their God is not a personal God. When you ask them about Jesus Christ, they say, oh yes, Jesus, he's a prophet, he's a good man, but no, he's not God. Christians and Muslims don't serve the same God. You look at the Jewish faith. Guys, Christianity came out of Judaism. We pray for them. We pray for Israel, especially right now as they're going through war. But they differentiate from us. Christianity and Judaism are not the same, mainly because of who is Jesus. They say that Jesus is not the Son of God. They say that Jesus is not God. Christianity says it is, or Jesus is the Son of God. And so, these people will come to your door, or you'll see them on the streets if you're witnessing, or maybe run into them on the campus, or just come to them in some form or fashion, or you guys will meet somehow. And they're going to throw this at you when you start talking about Jesus and about how he's God and the Trinity. And this is what they're going to say. They're going to say, listen, nowhere in the Bible does Jesus claim that he's God. And they step back like they've actually just done something. Hit the next slide. And I tell them, I say, no, you're right. Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus claim to be God. No, he never says those words, I am God. But we have enough scripture that we're going to look at today that can actually show us that Jesus is the Son of God. Not only is he the Son of God, but he is God in the flesh. Hit the next slide. So the question still remains, is Jesus God? No, he never said, I am God anywhere in the Bible. He never even said he was a prophet. He never even said he was man. But if you read scripture long enough, you're going to see a lot of references pointing to this fact. And again, why it's so relevant 2014 is because so many, in fact, every other religious belief system says he's not. Christianity says he is. But today I hope you leave having an answer. If it's no, then it's no. But if it's yes, you can be able to defend why you believe what you believe. Hit the next slide. You went a little too far. Oh, you know what? Go down to the one with the sphere and the line in it. I'm sorry. This is what a lot of people will settle on. They're going to settle on this with Jesus. They're going to say, well, you know what? Jesus, okay, we'll give you this. That he was half God and half man. We'll give you that. Listen, no. He is either 100% God or 100% man. You cannot half step it with Jesus. Next slide, please. Okay. This is the issue. 
when you cut, and just so you guys aren't thrown off guard, just so people can't use fancy words with simple definitions and try and confuse you, this is the debate before us today. It's called the hypostatic union. So when you hear this, or maybe in religious circles or Bible teachings or anything like that, when people talk about the hypostatic union, this is what they mean. Is how much of Jesus is God and how much of Jesus is man? And that's what we're trying to figure out right now. Next slide. For Christianity, for Jesus to be effective, for it to be how it is, for the Bible to be true, Jesus has to be 100% man, 100% God. No ifs, ands, or buts. Next slide. And so that's the question before us. What does the Bible say about that issue? Because if, if I give you my opinion and a dollar, that's going to get you a Coke, and that's about it. We shouldn't rest and say, well, my opinion says this. Well, my opinion. No. What does the Word of God say? That's the important issue. Because we as Christians have to have a standard. We have to have a standard, something to measure against. And for us, we have two standards, Jesus and the Bible. And thank God they're one and the same. Hit the next slide. If you will, take your Bible and turn with me just one book to the right. One book to the right. Turn to John 1, chapter 1. So let's take off. Let's set, start seeing what does God's word have to say about this issue. And I want you guys to write these verses down because when people come to your door claiming that Jesus is not God in the flesh, these are verses that you can keep handy to combat that and help the issue out. So John chapter 1, verse 1. We're not going to go through all 14 verses, but in your own free time, do so. I'm telling you, it's going to be a blessing to you. So John chapter 1, verse 1. And it says this. You guys are there? Amens? All right. Okay. John chapter 1, verse 1. It says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And I'm sure some of you are looking like, what? What? In the, you know, you have to read it like 20 times to kind of comprehend it. But really, what we're going to do is, I, let's skip down to verse 14. Let's take a look at verse 14, because verse 14 actually is the key to unlocking this and understanding 1 through 13. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 says this, that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Who does that sound like? Can you guys think of any story where somebody took on flesh to become like us? Anybody? Anybody know? Jesus. When did Jesus do this? When he was born. Thank you. Jesus left perfection, he left heaven, came down, born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, and he took on flesh. That's what it's referring to. This is saying that Jesus is the Word. So knowing that this, when it says the Word refers to Jesus, let's go back to ch uh, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. Let me, let me fill it in without doing damage to the text. In the beginning... All right. When every, even before everything was created, that's what that means. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. <gasps> no. I don't know how you can get around that, but people try. It says, well, he was God. Yeah, because he left heaven and took on flesh. So it was a separation of location, but not identity. Verse 2 says, and Jesus was with God in the beginning. That's powerful stuff. That is extremely hard to combat, but people will do it. So hit the next slide. Look at this verse up on the screen. Write this one, because this one's extremely powerful. It's very hard to get around. John chapter 10, verse 30 says this. 
Jesus is talking. And here's what Jesus says. He says this. Guys, just... Whew. I and the Father are one. Jesus just said, I and the Father were one. We're the same person. Now, hold on though. People are going to look at that, especially all those groups that I listed in the beginning, and they're going to say, no, you know what? Really, Alex, what, what, what that's referring to is it's just saying that Jesus and God, they're on the same page. Jesus is just saying, yeah, I believe in God. I support God. I move with God. You know, me and God, we're on the same team. And if we left it just at verse 30, they could be right. But what you guys need to do, what we all need to do, what I have to do, what I have to preach is text within context. Look at the next verse. Look at what it says. Because that type of belief of, hey, me and Jesus, me and God, we're on the same page. That's good until you read the next verse. Verse 31. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. They were mad that Jesus just said, me and the Father were one. Well, that seems harsh. Hit the next slide. Verse 32 says this. But Jesus said to them, he said, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? He's like, hey, what, what are you doing this for? Look at what they say, guys. And this is key. Remember, text within context. Verse 33. We are not stoning you for any of these referring to the miracles because people like being blessed, right? People like miracles. No one has a problem with that. But look what they say. The Jews replied, but for blasphemy, there's that word again. Why? Because you, and here we go, hypostatic union, all right, a mere man. Meaning in their eyes, Jesus was 100% man. 100% he just like us, felt like us, looked like us, smelt like us, acted like us, okay? Because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So when Jesus says, hey, I and the Father are one, they didn't think, oh, okay, yeah, Jesus, you know, he's saying he's with God and he's, he's following God. Yeah, we're doing that too. Okay, we're all cool. No, they understood that Jesus was very clearly saying, hey, me and, me and God, we're the same person. Get the stones. Hit the next slide. Turn your Bible with me, if you will, to Leviticus. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Leviticus, which is the third book of the Bible. You have Genesis, the first book, then Exodus, and then Leviticus. All right? So turn to the beginning and then start turning right. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Now we're in Leviticus chapter 24. We're in the 10th verse. Okay? Okay. What we're about to do right now is explain and show you the danger that Jesus put himself in when he claimed and pretty simply said, we've already seen just two verses, that he is God. So Leviticus chapter 24, verse 10. If you're there, give me an amen. All right, that sounds pretty good. Okay, Leviticus 24, verse 10. Look what it says. It says, now... The son of an Israelite mother and an Egyptian father went out among the Israelites and a fight broke out in the camp between him and another Israelite. And the son of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name. <gasps> the name. Back then, guys, you could not even announce or say God's name. You could not say anything close to it because they thought, man, we'll blaspheme God's name. You couldn't say Jehovah. You couldn't say anything. So what they did is they said, okay, instead of saying God, instead of saying Jehovah, we're just going to say the name or the Lord or the one. They were so careful with not blaspheming God's name that they just said that, the name. So let me come back to the text. So the son of, an, of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name with a curse. All right, he just cursed God's name. We do that a lot today too. 
So they brought him to Moses, and his mother's name was Shelomith, and the daughter of Debri, the Danite. And they put him in custody until the will of the Lord should be made clear to them. Look at what God says to Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, take the blasphemer outside the camp. All those who heard him are to lay hands on his head, and the entire assembly is to stone him. Rough. Verse 15, it says, Say to the Israelites, and this is God's own word, If anyone curses his God, he will be held responsible. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. And the entire assembly must stone him, whether an alien or a native born. When he blasphemes the name, he must be put to death. That's why the Pharisees were so upset. That's why they were ready to stone Jesus. Because in their minds, Jesus just blasphemed the name of the Lord. Hit the next slide. Guys, look at this. It's a little messed up, but you can just disregard that. Look at what Jesus says at the top verse right up there. Jesus says this, John 8, 58 and 59. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born. And Abraham was born thousands of years before Jesus took on flesh. Okay? Before Abraham was born, I am. <gasps> That's significant. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Why did that tick them off so bad? Because if you look at the bottom verse, uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, look at what he says. God said to Moses, right before Moses was about to go face Pharaoh and deal with all that in Egypt, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So what God just did is God said, listen, when they ask for a name and who's in charge of all this, tell them I am. I am who I am. So if you go up to that top verse, John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus just said, I am, saying, I'm God. Get the stones. Verse after verse, guys, Jesus never says, I am God. But we've seen enough evidence in scriptures, the standard, to show somebody to combat any type of false thinking, saying that Jesus is not God. Well, the next slide. Revelation 19.10. At this, okay, when John was talking to an angel, he said, and the angel talked to him, he said, at this I fell at his feet, referring to the angel, to worship him. But he said to me, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Look at what he says. He says, worship God. That's what the angel told John. He said, listen, don't worship me. Worship God. God. Alex, what in the world does that have to do with anything? You know, a lot of people will look at you and say, oh, well, you know, you're taking Jesus' words out of context. All right, you want to play that game? Let's go here. Hit the next slide. They worshiped him. They worshiped him. All right, next slide. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. Look at what this says. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Who's that baby that they're referring to, guys? Jesus. Jesus. So they're worshiping this baby Jesus. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. Next slide, Val. John, chapter 9, verse 38. Then the man said to Jesus, he's talking, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Hit the next slide, Val. Matthew 28, verse 9. After Jesus had risen from the, the, the grave... This is what happened. Suddenly, Jesus met him, talking about some of the disciples and some of his followers. 
Greetings, Jesus said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. They worshipped him as a baby. They worshipped Jesus before the cross. And they worshipped Jesus after the cross. Now why that's so significant is because like the angel said, you only worship God. If Jesus was not God, he would have clearly said, hey, 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 hey. I'm just a prophet. I'm just somebody else. I'm just a messenger. You don't worship me. Worship God. But every time someone worshiped God, Jesus, or every time someone worshiped Jesus, Jesus never turned their worship away. Through the actions of people, you can see that the people around him knew him as God. Hit the next slide. Is Jesus God? Hit the next slide. You can say, well, you weren't there. No, I wasn't there. But let's look at some people who were. See, if I wanted to know the character of, of Jacqueline and Rod, who do you think I would ask? The people that know them best. Let's see what some of the people say that know Jesus best. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Look at this. Simon Peter, okay, the guy who was right there with Jesus the whole time. He said, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who through the righteousness, look at what he says, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He calls Jesus God. And he's one of the ones that hung out with him 24-7. Next slide. Look at what Paul says. Paul, now remember Paul. Paul was the one who just outright just attacked the Christian church. He killed Christians. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, man. He was the guy to be. He persecuted the church like no other. Look at what his conversion did to him. People back then, before his conversion, they talked about Jesus. Man, he had him killed. Now look at what he says about Jesus after his conversion. Titus 2, verse 13. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of, watch this, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Other people talking about Jesus. Hit the next slide. Now, some of you might walk away today saying, well, yeah, okay, but what about the Trinity? What about the Holy Spirit part of it? We're not talking about that. This has nothing to do with today's sermon. But just so you don't think and you don't leave saying, oh, Alex is just trying to sidestep the issue. He's trying to avoid it. No, I'm going to appease you here and give you one verse to just satisfy your appetite. Look at this. Acts chapter 5, verse 34, okay? But Peter, all right, said to Ananias, now here's the story, that Ananias was supposed to sell some land and he was supposed to turn the money over to the church. Ananias ended up keeping some money for himself. So that's kind of the backstory going on here. Look at what he said to Ananias. He said, Ananias, why has, or Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to, get, get this, to lie to the Holy Spirit? That's going to be significant. Watch this. And keep part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Look at, remember he said, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? Look what he says now. You have not lied to men, but to God. In the same breath, Peter just said that the Holy Spirit and God, they're the same person. So logically, guys, if the Holy Spirit and God are the same person and Jesus and God are the same person, then you just discovered and realized the Holy Trinity, that Jesus is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God, Jesus is God, Holy Spirit is Jesus, all that stuff. Did I ever point out any word in the Bible that says this is the Trinity? Absolutely not. You don't see that word anywhere in the Bible. But I've just clearly explained and shown you where we see the idea of the Holy Trinity. Backed up by God's word, not by my opinion. Hit the next slide. Is Jesus God? Is Jesus God? Yes, Jesus is God in a bot. All right? You guys are going to remember that. Jesus is God in a bot. Hit the next slide. 
2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. It says, God made him, referring to Jesus, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We might become the righteousness of God. Listen, what that just clearly says is that it said Jesus left heaven because he was the only perfect sacrifice. Did Jesus want to leave heaven? No, he didn't. Who would? It's perfection. It's paradise. Eternal. So Jesus didn't want to leave heaven. He had to leave heaven. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God. God left heaven, took on flesh for you, for you, for me, for all of us. Hit the next slide, Val. So what? What does all that Alex just preached mean? Okay, so the Bible says that Jesus is God. So what? Okay, we've seen that there is a trinity. So what? Why should I care that Jesus is God? Because... Let me say it this way. Because Jesus is God, that means that God has spoken in his written word. And that's significant. Because if what Jesus said was true when he was walking the earth, that means that what Jesus was saying about the future is going to become and is true too. For those of you who know that you're saved, who have given your life to Christ, guys, you should have joy beyond joy. Because the person who claimed it, Jesus Christ, is actually God who claimed it. That should be exciting for you because what Jesus talked about when it comes to heaven is he talked about having homes and and, and rooms in heaven that we will get when we die. He talked about streets of gold. He talked about, or a street of gold. He talked about just a place where every tear, every sorrow, every pain will be wiped away. All things will be made new. A new heaven, a new earth, says the Bible. And that should encourage you guys that you will forever be in paradise with Jesus. That's exciting. Not because I said it, but because Jesus, who is God, said it. And if Jesus said it, then literally God said it. And we know that God, we can take him as his word. We have promises in the Bible that should just encourage us every day. We sing about a lot of them here at Oasis. And because Jesus is God, and because when Jesus spoke, God spoke, then for those who have not given their life to Christ, that means something also. It means that you do not have a place in heaven yet if you don't give your life to Christ. But you can. But if you've never given your life to Christ and you die today, then the truth of God's word, and this is not a scared straight tactic, but the truth of God's word says that you don't get to receive heaven. You don't get the blessings that Christians get when they die. You don't get any of the promises of God. It means that there is a place in hell for you. Not because God's sending you there, not because God wants you there, but because you have clearly rejected Jesus. And that should scare you. I hope it does. If you've never given your life to Christ, I hope you don't get an ounce of sleep until you do. Because that is the most important decision you can ever make. So because Jesus is God, then everything that Jesus said is God saying it through him. God saying it himself. So the things of the Bible are true. The promises, the predictions. 
guys. And if not you, then what about your family? What about your friends? What about those you care about? What about those who you cannot picture heaven without? Let me end by saying this, and I'm going to have Lydia, uh, the music team, come up. For a Christian, heaven, or let me say this, for a Christian, earth is the closest you're ever going to experience to hell. Think about that. But for those who are in rebellion to God, who have not given their life to Christ, because the Bible is very clear, Jesus said it, so God said it, you're either for him or you're against him. There's no gray, no half-stepping, no middle ground when it comes to Jesus. You're either for him or you're against him. If you can't say you're for him, then you're against him. It's that clear. So for the people who are in rebellion to God, the non-Christians, the one who reject Jesus, then what I'm about to say is also true. If that's you, and you continue to reject Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you don't want to put your trust and faith in Him, then earth is the closest to heaven you're ever going to see. That should scare you. Let me pray. Heavenly Father God, Lord, I just ask that you move and that you continue to move amongst the people. Lord, just let the verses today pierce the heart. May it move us to go win more people to Christ. May it move us to invite people to church. May it move us to share the gospel with those who do not know Jesus. And God, I thank you so much that we've seen relevant scripture today because we've had a legitimate question that deserves a legitimate answer. And we see the answer in the Bible. And so God, I'm asking right now that you move upon the hearts of the people here. God, for the ones who have not given their life to you, Lord, let today be the day, Heavenly Father. Let this moment be the moment. Heavenly Father, do not let them leave this place without in their hearts knowing that they are in a right relationship with you, that when they die, they will go to heaven. And with your heads bowed, guys, and, and your, your heart still focused on God, listen, if that is you, if you've never given your life to Christ, because honestly, you only need to do it once, but you truly need to mean it. If you've never given your life to Christ, here's what the Bible says to do. Is it simple? You're absolutely right. But the Bible says simply to turn away, meaning repent, turn away from the sins, turn away from that type of rebellious lifestyle against God and when you turn away from it completely a U-turn, a 180 then you got to turn to something else and that something else is Jesus. The Bible says to repent, to turn away and to turn to Jesus to put your belief in Him. Not just a little bit. Not just a touch. Not just a toe in the water. You got to jump all in. You got to jump all in. Does that mean you're going to know everything right away? No. But you learn as you go. It's a faith issue. It's not a head issue. It's a faith issue. You have faith that that seat kept you up. You didn't check the bolts. You didn't check the hinges. You just sat down because you had faith that that would keep you up. When you get in the car, I don't see anyone examining their seatbelt, every stitch, every part. No, they just simply click and go because they have faith that if something happens to them, that that seatbelt will keep them safe. Guys... If you've never given your life to Christ, I beg you, let today be the day that you put your faith fully in Him. I'm going to be in the back. Lloyd's going to be in the back. So guys, this is the time. Just come. We're going to pray for you. Well, if you want to give your life to Christ, we'll help you in that direction. Because really it's up to you to cry out to God, to call out to Him. It's not a prayer, but it's a heart issue, a heart decision.
between you and God and you and God alone.